Hi, um, my name is Katie Paxton Fair. I am a PhD student at Cranfield University in Defence and Security. And what I'm going to be presenting is my undergraduate dissertation work. So, for a background, I'm not an archaeologist. I've got a degree in computer science. So, that probably gives you a different lens on my project in general. So, I'm looking at the problem as limitation. So, what artists love to do when they design things is to limit themselves because <laughs> limiting yourself brings new ideas to get around those limitations. So I impose a limitation to follow the original steps of the linear B decipherment, but instead of using traditional methods to use a computer. So it's a different approach to an interdisciplinary project. So a bit of background, if you don't know anything about linear B, it was found on Crete and on select places of the mainland. It's syllabic, which means that each character, each little symbol, is a consonant and a vowel, or a vowel. Um, it was used administratively, so a lot of these are lists of things. So there was 50 soldiers at Pylos. Um, and it's got some other related languages, uh, including linear A, Cyprum and Noah, Korean hieroglyph, classical Cypriot. So what is the recipe for decipherment? Well, step one is you need accurate transcriptions of all the text that you can get your hands on. The more, the better. Then we look for evidence of inflection. So what inflection is, is this idea that words change based on their context. And they change predictably. So in English, we have walk, walked, walking, which is inflected forms of the verb walk, which denotes the tense. Um, then what we do is we create this grid of characters. So you can see this on the side where we've got all the characters. And what these are, each column are the vowels and each row are the consonants. So the character sort of at the very top corner is A, the character below that is that, if that makes sense. Um, so then you start to assign values. Once you know what characters are related, you start to say, well, this is A. And I know this is A because I can, can translate some of it. So the sort of system flow that I developed followed this recipe very precisely with a bit of a twist. So the first thing we have is accurate uh, transcriptions of all the tablets. Then we find evidence of inflection. This is pretty much exactly the same as it was originally done. And then you get to the cool computer science part of it. So one thing that computers are great at are graphs. One thing humans are not so great at are graphs. So originally, these connections between the vowels and the consonants and everything else were expressed as these tables, as Ventress kind of moved them across when he changed his mind. But we can use graphs, and computers are great with graphs. Then you have a final grid of characters. So this is the final output, but I'm going to walk through it step by step. Oh, phone's not working. These are some linear B characters. So first off, Koba was the one who originally found evidence that linear B was inflected. Her algorithm was to select words that are followed by ideograms and numerals, as these are most likely nouns. And these are the words that are most likely going to change based on context. And you find the same word in different contexts. So if you take a tablet, you can assume tablet a tablet is in, te it's in the past tense. Another tablet is in the future tense. So you assume that these are the same words, just in different contexts. And then we find predictable patterns. So patterns that we can see and record. So this is an algorithm that I'm going to walk you through, uh, which is sort of the pseudocode, if you like. So first off, we have a list of all the characters that I need to... Oh, God, careful. Um, so this is a visual representation. I'm standing here because it doesn't... There's animations. So we loop through each word. We compare walk to walk which has a similarity of zero. Why is it a similarity of zero? They're the same word. So then we look walk and talk. So they're not the same word. What do we do? Loop through the characters and increase the similarity if they're the same. If they're not the same, we stop. So we look at walk and walking. We expect that to be a similarity of four because all the characters are the same. So we can increase the similarity until it gets to four. So the next iteration of the loop, we have walk and wanting. So we have the W and the A that are the same. So we increase the similarity by one because of W, two because of the A, 
And then it gets to L and N, so it's not, it's not similar, so it stops. So using this, we can apply it to linear B. So as you can see, on one side, we have the actual output of the program. Um, and on the other side, I have gone through meticulously, taken all the results, and checked if they're correct or not. So we can see this algorithm works quite well, and it's a lot faster than doing it manually. So, assuming we don't know that, how do we know what inflections are correct? How do we know what similarity is, is the right one? So we sort of find the sweet spot and we can use this data to then build our graph. So, creating the connections. So, COPA also showed how characters can be connected. That is to say that how we can tell a character shares a consonant or shares a vowel. So, if we look at this example with Latin, the first two characters are the same, the next isn't. These characters likely share a vowel. In this case, we have servusa and servuma, in the sense that a lot of Indo-European languages, not just Latin, but also um, some Semitic languages, have this in common when you write them using syllables. And for the other ones, if the characters are the same, but then they differ, they most likely share a consonant. So using these predictable patterns, finding these patterns, plotting these patterns, we can then start to build this kind of graph. So wo connects to we, connects to no, connects to mo, and you can build up this whole graph of connected characters. You don't even need to know whether or not it shares a vowel or a consonant, because you know if it shares some, it's probably an inflection. So this is the result. Obviously, this is a massive graph, but this is representing every single connection within linear B. So each node, each point on the graph, is a single linear B character. Each edge is a shared vowel or consonant. We may not know which ones are which. And then we take this big graph, and because computers are great at dealing with graphs, we plot it to a table. So this is kind of a smaller version of the graph. You can see what it looks like. So you can see that re connects to, there we go, reconnects to C over there with a weight of two, which means it appears twice. And over here, you can see the final grid it produces. So there are some mistakes in here. For example, you know, we've got some null values. Uh, where is it? That one of them's, that one's in the wrong place. But fundamentally, because computers are great at dealing with graphs, it's an excellent way to look at this problem in a really computational fashion. So in conclusion, you can do it. Um, but most approaches to problems like decipherment use machine learning. So I think we often get lost in using new technologies and, oh yeah, we have the biggest computer we can throw at it. We have TensorFlow, we have neural networks, let's just go for it. Sometimes you have to step back and think about how it was done originally. And archaeology, especially computational archaeology, sits at this really interesting point between the past and the future. It's using sort of technology and our massive computers that we have to represent something that's our past and our shared history. So working with limitations can introduce really creative solutions. So because I'm a computer scientist and I look at things <coughs> differently, when I looked at linear B and saw these connection patterns, I saw a graph almost immediately. So for me, that really was a sort of brainwave because it hadn't been done before. Uh, the next thing is that interdisciplinary projects are great sources of personal growth. So I'm not, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a computer scientist. My degree is in computer science. I learned all I know about archaeology in a year for my dissertation. Um, and they can join, like, interdisciplinary projects can join together. So what I personally take from this is my programming ability, my computer science, my computational thinking has massively improved because I'm no longer looking at problems and thinking, what can I throw a computer at it to solve? I'm looking at problems as talking to people and getting that kind of feedback in a very different way. I would like to spend more time with computer scientists and develop this thinking more because I think it's so important for my own personal growth. I may be a computer scientist, and I don't know anything about archaeology, I know a little bit now, but not so much. But that experience, reading an algorithm written down and being able to go to myself 
Yeah, I understand this. I can take this and put it onto a computer. It's a skill you just don't get taught in computer science. You don't get taught how to think algorithmically in that kind of way. And it's going to change how I approach every single computational problem I have. Because instead of thinking about problems as a, like, this is a computer, throw more computer at it. I'm going to think about it as, what can I get out of people and disciplines that I'm not a part of? So, thank you for listening. Um, you can find my Lenny B data sets on GitHub. I have a data set of all the tablets, all the characters, all the inflection patterns, all the tablets that contain nouns. There's a bunch in there. And I have written an implementation of the inflection algorithm that you can have a look at and use. So, has anyone got any questions? Oh yeah, there's my contact information as well. Feel free to send me a message. Wow. Great. <laughs>